Hey everyone, welcome back to Falcon Central Radio Show on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. I'm Aaron Freeman, founder of FalFans.com, and I'm back this week with my co-host Scott Karasik, who writes over at Sports Not. We are back again to talk about the Atlanta Falcons. We'll update you guys on tonight's show, but with the latest Falcons news, we will also do our positional preview, which we've been doing the last couple of weeks. This week, we're going to be talking about the defensive front seven. So if you play defensive line or linebacker for the Falcons, we will probably talk about you tonight. And as usual, we'll be answering your guys' mailbag questions at the end of the show. So, Scott, let's uh, start things off on a slightly somber note. Um, former Falcons head coach Marion Campbell, a.k.a. the Swamp Fox, died last week at age 87. He coached the Falcons two times. He had two stints with the Falcons, one in the mid-70s and then again in the late 80s. Not exactly the best times um, for Falcon football. He had a combined record of 17 and 51, which is pretty astounding. Um, you know, he was hired as the interim coach back in like 74, and he was fired basically midway through 76. And he got the job again in, in 87 and then basically got bounced by 89. Now, the one thing you can say about Marion Campbell was he was a heck of a defensive coordinator, um, which sort of explains why they kept giving him um, head coaching opportunities because pretty much all his Falcons defenses for like the six years prior to him getting hired in 74 and, and the one year in 86 before he got hired a second time, were either top 10 in scoring or total defense um, for all those years when he was defensive coordinator of the team. So, um, you know, our condolences to his family. If you have anything you want to add, Scott, before we move on to the next item, the floor is yours. I mean, really just, you know, it sucks that he died, but he was also old. And I mean, you know, like our RIP Marion Campbell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was before my time. I, I didn't become a Falcon fan until the Glanville era, so I didn't really know a whole lot about him. But I just figured we'd uh, you know, mention it since there's not a whole lot going on with the Falcons. And uh, there, there's not. Yeah, which is, which is a good thing this time of year. One of those no news is good news, or if the only news is like injury settlements and signing your random late run veteran like a Dwight Freeney this time of year. That's the kind of news you want. You don't want like, oh hey, buddy got arrested for, you know, DUI after hanging out in a strip club. That's not what you want to see. Yep. So speaking of uh, nothing that's that big, uh, our next news item is there was a article on blogging the boys, with, blogging the boys, which is the Dallas Cowboys SB Nation uh, website. Basically, they they got a leaked picture of the Cowboys draft board from 2016, this past draft. And it's only worth us discussing just because of the Cowboys had, they were able to decipher some of the grades that they put on certain players. And three of the players the Falcons picked were on there. And, um, you know, just curious what, you know, our takes are on that. Um, the Cowboys had a third round grade on both Keanu Neal and Deion Jones and a fifth round grade on Austin Hooper. Scott, do you have any thoughts on that? Every team grades on a curve. Um, so basically every team just looks at how a guy is going to fit their scheme. Keanu Neal is not a great fit for a cover two. That defense is a cover two. Of course he's going to be a third round grade for them. Uh, Deion Jones isn't a great fit for them. Except that outside linebacker, but the consensus is everybody had somewhere between a, a high second to a mid third round grade on Deion Jones. So the fact is the Cowboys are right in the same range, right where everybody was expecting him. I personally had a third round grade on Deion Jones. So the fact that he was there makes sense. I had a second round grade on Keanu Neal. So to see the, the, the Cowboys with a second, uh, third round grade on Keanu Neal, that makes sense. I had, I think a third round, let me pull it up real quick. I had a, I don't know off the top of my head what I had for Hooper, but I want to say it was a, a late second, early third round grade on him. And the fact that they had a fifth round, yeah, I had a 50, which is a late second rounder. Um, the fact that they had him as a fifth round grade, I mean, it is what it is. 
I'm never too worried about what another team graded because there's 32 different teams with hundreds of players on each board. And it really is just about how the guy fits with the Falcons. The Falcons probably had that same mid to late second round grade that I had on Hooper. You know, they probably had a high, a way higher grade than what I had on Keanu Neal. Love Keanu Neal, didn't love a scheme fit for everybody, which is why I gave him a mid second. Um, I also didn't really like Keanu, Carl Joseph as much as Keanu Neal, but within the scheme, I can understand why he went in the first round too. Um, but yeah, no, it's all about the team and how it fits. So not everybody grades on a just 100%, how is this guy going to fit in the NFL? They grade, how is this guy going to fit in the NFL within my scheme? Because that's all they care about. They care about their success within their scheme and how that's going to work. That's why you know the Falcons probably had Vic Beasley in their top three last year where they probably didn't have Todd Gurley that high compared to Easily. It's the same kind of thought. Yeah, all, all well said. Um, for clarity, I had a high second round grade on Keanu Neal, like barely a notch below a first round grade. Uh, I had a fourth round grade on Deion Jones, and I had a third round grade on Austin Hooper. But basically, what you said, every team's, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. And you look at some of the Cowboys' needs. And, you know, they have a pretty good run-stopping um, strong safety in Barry Church. And Keanu Neal's game is, is similar to what sort of Church brings to the table. And that they didn't place a high premium on a really good run-stopping um, strong safety. They seem to be looking more for a coverage guy. Um, Deion Jones, you know, they probably saw him more as a weak side linebacker with Sean Lee being there. They probably didn't have as high a grade on him as – Obviously, the Falcons did when the Falcons seeing him more as a middle linebacker. Um, Hooper, you know, the, the Cowboys seem to take a tight end in almost every single draft, it seems like. Um, haven't been too successful finding that that obvious heir apparent for uh, Jason Witten. And obviously, based, based off of their grade of Austin Hooper, they didn't sort of see him in that capacity. Probably, you know, I would guess because they probably didn't like his blocking as much as they seem to typically prefer um, so it is what it is. Uh, you know, if, if you're one of those people that didn't like the Falcons draft and this is more fodder for you, if, if you're one of those people that did like the Falcons draft, this is basically meaningless, but we're talking about it because it's mid July and we need stuff to talk about. So, um, let's move on to something that is a little bit more closer related to the Falcons. Um, today the team announced that they cut center James Stone with an injury settlement. Um, anybody that can go and see my Twitter feed at Falcfans can sort of see my overall opinions on it. Um, but I, I guess I'll give the floor to, to Scott to express his thoughts on that move. I didn't think he was any good. So he was probably the fourth best center on the roster. And he's now cut. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give my thoughts on it, and then we'll, we'll get more on, on how it affects the Falcons. Um, not a whole lot of degree, because obviously we have Alex Mack, and we have other guys that can potentially be his backup. I personally thought James Stone was better than Mike Person. I thought he outplayed. I thought if you wanted to see the best center play from the Falcons in 2015, then you should watch the uh, Saints game, that Thursday night game early in the season which Stone started, obviously at the bad snap, but I thought that sort of overshadowed what was generally a pretty good game, especially as a run blocker. Um, you know, once they put him on IR last year, I basically knew his career as a Falcon was pretty much over. So him getting cut doesn't surprise me. It doesn't really affect the team all that negatively because, as I said, they have other options that, as backups to Alex Mack. Um you know, I hope James Stone gets some opportunities elsewhere. You know, it's it's interesting that it's an injury settlement because if I'm not mistaken, he missed most of mini camp, if not all of mini camp and OTAs, with whatever I think it was a foot or a knee injury that he had he last had year. Torn ACL last year. Yeah, there you go. Um, 
I guess more where how this impacts the Falcons is more doesn't this put their roster at 88 players going into training camp, which means they have room for two more guys. Um, in, they've been at 89 for most of the summer, so it's kind of been expected that they've been waiting for one more move. But this at least frees them up to bring somebody else in, I guess. It's weird looking at the roster and seeing just 88 people on it, like 88 guys on it. But then when you kind of think about it, why would you – I mean, they, they probably want to see more reps from some guys. Like, they want to see C.J. Goodwin get more reps. They want to see, you know, probably Sherrod Niesman, Robinson Terese, you know, Brian Poole get some more reps and see how they actually handle the defense. Um, I'm probably one of the few, but I'm of the belief that Brian Poole is probably trying out for both nickel corner and backup free safety, not just his one role that he's listed in on the roster. Um, just because he's got experience doing a little bit of both. I think C.J. Goodwin is probably going to be competing with Akeem King for that nickel corner spot just because they really want to see where how he's going to do it. And Alford is going to play that slot corner no matter what. Like they, They're committing to Alford in the slot, which is probably for the best. And I think you'll agree with me on this, Aaron. Alford's the second best – defender the Falcons have right now. Yes, I will agree with you. I want to I want to put Jonathan Babino still in that spot, but yeah, Alfred is legitimately the second best defense. I, I know you're a USS Babino homer, but we we can both agree that Babino is like fourth or fifth on the team right now. Yeah, no, no. I'm a homer for um for Jonathan Babino, but yeah, Alfred is legitimately probably you know, I think you can even make a case that he's probably the second best corner in the division after Trufant. I think you could easily make that case. Because Josh Norman isn't in the division anymore. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, all the corners in the division, there's maybe one guy who you could say is better than him. Right now, at least. And that'd be... Uh, Keenan Lewis, if Lewis is 100% healthy. Like, I don't think Brent Grimes is better than Robert Alford. He wasn't last year, I can tell you that much. He definitely was not last year. I think Vernon Hargreaves could definitely – could could be. If anybody could be, it, it's Hargreaves. Um, and that'd be fine. Like, I'm sure Robert Alford wouldn't lose any sleep if a top 10 pick winds up being better than him at cornerback in the division. I don't think he's going to care. As long as he does his job and he gets paid eventually, he'll be happy. I don't think Jalen Collins will ever be that. I'm just kind of losing faith in him. The more I go back and watch his film, the more I'm just disappointed. Yeah. He did did some good things and he showed some good stuff, but it's just disappointing. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how much improvement he shows this summer. Like if it's a big leap forward, then I'll – I, I'll jump back on the bandwagon, but you know, it, to me, it's always it's always important, especially with rookies, to see how much growth they show from year one to year two. You can often sort of tell who's going to make it and who's not going to make it based off of that alone. And Vic Beasley, same thing goes for him. I love Vic Beasley. I think he will show that growth, but you got to see it. And Justin Hardy, same thing. Now, I thought Jer- Grady Jarrett could legitimately be the third best player on the Falcons defense last year. And if he takes that step this year and Derek Shelby steps up and Rasheed Hagman finally steps up, this team, this defense could be a lot of fun to watch. I think the linebackers are still, you're going to have works in progress this year, no matter what you do. Yeah. And so speaking of that, let's, uh, let's jump into um, talking about the front seven. And where do you want to start, Scott? You you talked a little bit about Grady Joe. You want to start with the interior defensive line, the linebackers, or do you want to go with the edge players? I'm always about talking about the big guys up front, moving to the edges, and then talking about the linebackers after. So let's talk about the interior defensive line. Start it started out. Um, on the roster right now, you've got guys Tyson Jackson, Adrian Claiborne, the USS Babineau, Derek Shelby, um, 
the big man, Rashid Hageman, Malachi Goodman, who's been disappointing for me because I thought he would be a lot better, uh, Grady Jarrett, Joey Embu, Corey Johnson, and Chris Mays. And basically, I think you're going to see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably seven of those, maybe even eight make the roster um, of those ten guys. So you've got not many battles there. It's more about who's going to start, where's the, where is the, um, the fit for each guy. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, and, you know, probably the big thing that's happening at this spot is you have Hageman and Tyson Jackson basically switching positions. And I think that's interesting because we've, we've talked about this a bunch on previous shows throughout the summer because we've both openly questioned why, what sort of role the Falcons sort of see for Tyson Jackson this year, given that he's not really, you know, at least based off of his previous play, he's not a great three technique uh, defensive tackle and he's getting paid a lot of money and he's almost a certain guarantee to sit the bench um, this year. So it is one of those things where, you wonder is are they moving Hageman out like at least when I first heard the news that they were moving Hageman out the defensive end, I thought it was under the assumption, oh, they know Hageman can play three tech. They want to see if he can play the the five technique defensive end spot and basically they can get, you know, kill two birds with one stone if Hageman can basically take over Jackson's role. But you hear things like, you know, they seem to really like Tyson Jackson, you know. We'll see how that that works out once final roster decisions are made. But um, where do you sort of stand on that? Since this is the week to discuss it. I mean, as much as I love Rashid Hageman as a football player, he's got to show that he can do that position within this. Scheme. I thought he did a decent job in 2014, kind of playing a five tech. And I thought last year they basically just said, we're going to take everything away from you, focus on this one technique, focus on this one spot, don't worry about anything else. This is your job. And this year is more about adding something to his plate. And I think in the end we are still going to see Rashid Hageman line up at both spots. We'll see him at three sometimes, we'll see him at five sometimes, but we're not going to see him 100% just 100 percent at one spot either or on the flip side i think if he does show that he's good enough at it and say derek shelby shows that he's good enough at that spot they're going to be like why do we need tyson jackson and if that three technique they're like well we got hageman babineau you know adrian claiborne that can all kind of play that and rotate that position for the full 100 percent of the snaps why do we need Tyson Jackson? So I think they're going to kind of look through everything and just be like, well, why is he here? And I think it's as long as Shelby and – and this is huge. As long as Shelby and um, Hageman can look like the guys that the Falcons really want them to look like, I don't see Tyson Jackson making the roster long term. Now, they might keep him this year just as depth and maybe keep him an active a game or two, but I don't see him as a guy who 100% makes the roster. Like It's it's a question on whether he's going to make the roster and whether they're comfortable cutting him or not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because when we signed Shelby, my immediate assumption was, oh, he'll be the, the strong side defensive end in the base defense, which will give us much more – pass rushing ability from that spot than we got from Tyson Jackson or really what Hageman could potentially provide. And then in nickel, he could kick in inside and sort of be in the mix with Babineau and um, Grady Jarrett and Claiborne. Basically, we would have four options to throw out there on nickel downs and basically whoever's the two freshest guys could um, play that spot. But, you know, now you're not hearing a whole lot of Shelby getting a lot of edge work. And so now the question is, is he going to play Leo in the base or is he strictly going to, is he going to have any role in the base if Hageman's at defensive end 
and if Brooks Reed and, and other of these guys and Upshaw get more Leo looks, then you're sort of sitting in the back questioning. It's like, did the Falcons just give all this money to a guy who's only going to basically play the exact same role that Jonathan Babineau played, um, which is basically be a nickel interior pass rush specialist, which no one's going to sit here and say that that doesn't, that that's an important job. Cause as we know, you know, the Falcons are going to play nickel 60 plus percent of the time. And so he's going to get a lot of reps doing that, but it is interesting that, you know, where Shelby really made his bones at in Miami was being a edge rusher from the left side of the defense behind Cameron Wake. And, and sort of basically now if the Falcons only envision him primarily as an interior player, in the same way that they use Adrian Claiborne at the beginning of last year, it does raise some questions of, of whether or not that's the ideal usage. But again, you know, we don't know, and that's what we're going to have to keep our eyes on going into training camp because maybe Dan Quinn and Brian Cox see something um, that, you know, the Miami coaches didn't necessarily see or, or didn't exploit or something like that, and the Falcons can better utilize it. So. That's that to me is the big question involving those guys in terms of how they're going to be used this year. I mean, it really does make it tough. I guess right now I would see in the base, we are going to see like Hageman. And if I had to guess at the nose, it would be Embu. And if I had to guess at the three tech, it's probably Tyson Jackson as like the main guys who play those spots. And then in the nickel, you'll see Grady Jarrett and uh, Derek Shelby inside. That's probably what I'm thinking you see. Um, Shelby did have a lot of success playing that left edge rusher, but Miami never really tried him inside. And when they did, he did have success. And I do think that it's going to be a good fit for him long term to play inside on nickel downs, but I don't think that it's his – base position, if you will. I think in base, you could see a four-man line a lot of the time with Shelby, uh, Hageman, Shelby, Hageman, um, Embu, and Jackson. Now, who's playing three or five? That all depends on how they want to line them up. It could be Jackson. It could be Hageman. It doesn't really matter to me. But I think that's going to be a common line up front. And I think that's still a better line than putting up Croy Bierman on the edge. And, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I'm the last Croy Bierman fan out there. Um, I don't think he's as bad as people made him out to be, but. You just can't rush the passer. I, okay. yeah, I mean, yeah, he's not a great pass rusher. But no, think- and that's why Shelby was brought in. Yeah, no, no. I, I think I think that's a fair statement that Shelby's a better pass rusher than Corey Beerman, but you know, I don't know if Brooks Reed and Courtney Upshaw are better pass rushers than Corey Beerman. And I think those guys might be the guys that they're sort of designating to replace him in that I base. Think, Leon I think they are. I definitely think they are. They provide more in terms of at least bull rush to beat down the the tackle and wear him down before you throw Vic Beasley out at him. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, we'll see. I might be singing a different tune after, you know, a month from now. But, I mean, th- that to me is, is going to be an interesting question, um, seeing how those edge guys sort of find roles. Because it, it does look like the Falcons are going to be using – we know Vic Beasley is going to be primarily a left defensive end in the nickel. Um, that's going to be his primary role with the team. Um but in base downs, he's still going to get some reps at strong side linebacker, but it doesn't sound like he's going to be the starter there. Um, so it does, you know, Upshaw and Reed both were linebackers prior to them coming to Atlanta. And now it seems like the Falcons are poised to play them more as exclusively at defensive ends. And it's going to be interesting to see how those guys make that transition. Brooks Reed hasn't played defensive end since he was in college at Arizona State, you know, five, six years ago. Upshaw played some D end at Alabama. Um, was pretty, you know, he basically had a similar role to Reggie Ragland this past year, playing a lot of D end and um, 
their nickel sub packages and playing strong side linebacker in their base and in their you know hybrid three four scheme. Um, he did that at in Baltimore too. Yeah, yeah, he did that too. You know, because they they have a similar hybrid three four scheme. So, you know, yeah. basically D end and outside linebacker is often they're interchangeable in their scheme. But um, you know, I'm curious to see how those guys adjust to it. And it seems like the Falcons, if they don't go out and sign someone like a Dwight Freeney or another edge rusher, um, you know, they're going to be relying heavily on on Reed and Upshaw, even if they're playing in the base defense. Um, pulling some weight, a lot more weight than those two have historically shown as pass rushers this year. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, in the base defense, but I think in the pass rush sets, you're going to have Claiborne on one end, you're going to have Dick on the other. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I don't think there's really any question. I, like, I think our nickel is pretty much, we kind of know exactly what our nickel front is going to be. It's going to be Vic on the left side, Babineau probably beside him, uh, Shelby right beside him, and then Claiborne at right defensive end. And maybe we see guys like Jarrett and, and a couple other guys getting some looks occasionally. But I think you'll I think you'll see Grady Jarrett in there before you'll see Babineau. Jarrett and uh, Beasley on the left side because they did that a lot in college and they have a lot of experience together. They've got chemistry together. And there were times last year that they would put that set out there and it would actually create some sort of pressure on one side, but the backside wasn't getting anything. Um, and I think with Claiborne, Claiborne always does his best pass rushing from the right, which I don't know why, but he does. So it might come down to that nerve thing that he had. Um, but he's always done his best, best pass rushing from the right. And I think between Shelby and Babineau, you'll rotate that other spot. Um, but I do agree with you. I think in the middle you have Shelby, Babineau, and Jarrett, and then the edges will 99% of the time be Claiborne and uh, Vic. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really like the real competitions this year is for the base defense, which kind of is a 180 from last year where we, we were pretty much knew it was going to be, you know, Hageman, Jackson, Soli, and – we thought it was going to be Vic and then eventually became a uh, beer man. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting battle because, you know, one of the complaints you could definitely say about the Falcons pass rush last year was that they did with that front four in their base defense, they weren't really getting a lot of pressure. And those guys were out there, you know, for 40, 45% of the time. And it was basically 40 to 45% of the de- time where the Falcons weren't getting any pressure on the quarterback because primarily those guys weren't really doing anything. So you you hope that this year one of the big changes the Falcons will make is having their um, base defense be a lot more effective getting pressure. And when you see signings like Shelby and, and whatnot, you think, okay, that's a move designed to do that. I, obviously having Grady Jarrett playing that nose role in the, in the nick, I mean, in the base also is going to add a lot more quickness and and explosiveness there. But, you know, then you see moves like Tyson Jackson being moved, and it's like, okay, if you wanted to get better pass rushers, you should have gotten rid of Tyson Jackson because pretty much you could try it out anybody over that and be better than him. And then the questions at the Leo spot, you know, those remain unanswered. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Falcons sort of figure it out in training camp. We know Dan Quinn likes to mix and match things. So I think even what we get at the beginning of the season – is going to be a work in progress and we may eventually work our way by the end of the year to something that we can settle on and be like, yeah, this is, this is our guys, but we'll see. And it could end up being a situation where we're just completely wrong right now. And the defense gets completely shuffled up and we wind up seeing Tyson Jackson get cut and, the base in the interior is your typical 4-3 defensive tackles, you know. You got Hageman and Babineau, you know, and that's in the – so you got uh, Hageman and Embu. And then on the nickel you'll have Babineau and uh, Jared. And then Shelby does play, like, left end in the base. You know, the strong side defensive end in the base. And then you don't have – you'll have, like, Courtney Upshaw as the right end. So, I mean – between the edge and the interior defensive lineman, we could end up seeing a really standard set 
this year quite often where you're not expecting um, I guess you could say you're not expecting an awful pass rush but you're also not expecting perfect run defense either yeah yeah it's it's gonna be interesting because they couldn't try to mix and match it and try to get a couple of pass rushes in their base and a couple of you know guys that you would might label as good solid run defenders in their nickel um, so it's gonna be you know we'll see how it plays out um, let's talk a little bit about the linebackers where I think we're going to see a lot of competition and right now sort of picking who you think is going to start, you, you know, you can just flip a coin and, and basically pick three linebackers and be like, yeah, that's a decent chance that those guys might be the three guys that start. So, I mean, we, we've been hearing, at least in many camps, we heard and, and saw and read that Deion Jones was getting a lot of first team reps at middle linebacker. Devon J. Campbell was getting a lot of reps at first team weak side linebacker. Philip Wheeler was getting a, a bunch of reps at that strong side linebacker spot. He seems like he might be replacing Brooks Reed as their go to base starter in the strong side. And then he'll get spelled by Beasley. Um, and, you know, where does that leave guys like Paul Warlow and Sean Weatherspoon in the mix? Where do you sort of fall in that, Scott? I mean, how do I put this? If this was 2013 and we got 2013 versions of Paul Warlow and Sean Weatherspoon, I would be very happy. If we could get a 2011 version of Sean Weatherspoon, I think he would be the starting middle linebacker, no questions asked. I don't think we're going to see that. I think Sean Weatherspoon came back to be depth. I think Paul Warlow came back, and he might end up being the middle linebacker this year, but after this year, I think he's gone. Um, I think Devondre Campbell was by far the biggest – draft pick this year because I think he's going to start right away and I think he's going to be asked to do that KJ Wright role where he's guarding tight ends and you know that's his main job he's a nickel linebacker and he's going to start at weak side in the base and I think he's going to do a good job at it the the wild card here is Deion Jones Deion Jones needs to bulk up a bit or at least get strong enough to where he's not 220 pounds halfway through the season Paul Warlow can be that base middle linebacker at least this year. And I know it's not going to make everybody happy, but you pull him out and you put Deion Jones in in the nickel, and then you have Jones out there to actually go out and cover people and use his speed. And Jones has already shown in college that he is a good zone linebacker, and that's all the Falcons really need right now. Um that strong side linebacker, you're going to see Brooks Reed. You're going to see Vic Beasley there, but I'm with you. I think Philip Wheeler's going to be the starter. Like, that's the guy. Um, but you'll see Reed get probably 10% of the snaps. You'll see Beasley probably get 25 to 30% of the snaps. I think the long-term plan is to have Beasley be that starter that no matter when they're in the base, Beasley's out there as strong side linebacker because – Dan Quinn blitzes that strong side linebacker on passing downs 65% of the time. So it's just more snaps for Beasley to get after the quarterback. It's just adding a pass rusher in the base. So when, when you see Beasley, I think by the end of the season, Beasley will have every snap at strong side linebacker, no matter what. And he'll be there in the base, no matter what. And you'll see him get in there and he'll be there to attack the quarterback. Like that's going to be his role. Vic, go out there, get the quarterback. All right. It's nickel. Go put your hand in the dirt, get the quarterback. Oh, you're tired. All right, cool. You've got Shelby. We'll throw Shelby out there. And maybe that's what Shelby's role is going to be too. He'll play in the base, but then if he needs to spell Vic in the nickel, he can spell him on the left side and still provide decent pass rush. Collecting pass rushers is never a bad thing in today's NFL. I agree. It's interesting to me because 
you know, at first glance, I would have said, I don't think Jones or Campbell are week one starters. It doesn't seem, you know, looking at their where they were at the end of their college careers at Minnesota and LSU, uh, respectively. Um, I don't. I don't think Jones is going to be a starter. I think he's going to be the nickel guy. Comes in, replaces Warlow in the nickel. Okay. But my point is, like, I wouldn't look at either of those two guys as I would say pro ready, right now. But it is one of those things where, you know, I'm a big Sean Weatherspoon fan, but the player he was in Arizona last year was not very good. Now, obviously, the take is when you tear your Achilles, it's you. It's it's one of those 18 month injuries where it really takes you. It's the second year after you come back that you really sort of show rebound to what you were. So that's sort of the hope with Weatherspoon. And I think if if Weatherspoon is that guy, then he's probably our best linebacker. Or not probably, definitely is our best linebacker. Um, You know, and it's real tough for me to understand if the Falcons sort of, you know, tendered Paul Warlow at the high air level. And, you know, he was their team captain the last two years for them to basically be like, no, we're done with you um, as a starter. It wouldn't make sense. It makes sense for me from a football standpoint, um, but it is would be a, a weird sort of thing for me. But at the same time, all that being said, you know, my conventional wisdom is the Falcons start the year with the three veterans of Wheeler, Warlow and Weatherspoon as the starters. But I also sort of feel like there is a very, very, very good chance, if not a certain chance, that at some point this year we're going to see the combination of Beasley, Jones, and Campbell starting at those three linebacker spots because I think that's where the Falcons envision the future is. And so to me the big question is, is there going to be a certain point during the regular season where the Falcons say, forget the veterans, we're building towards the future, and we go with those three guys? And there's at least a decent possibility – you know, certainly as we approach um, training camp, more so than I thought, you know, in May, right after the draft is that the Falcons like those guys enough that they say, well, the future is now. We don't, you know, Warlow, Weatherspoon, and Wheeler all are basically under one year deals. They're not the future. Let's get these young guys out on the field as soon as possible and let's develop them and, and, and see what we can do with them. And, you know, from that perspective, it makes sense if you're building towards the future. I think the concern is that you're going to deal with some growing pains, um, particularly early on in the season, which, you know, you were going to you were expecting the greatest linebacker play from the veterans anyway. So it isn't like it is a it should be it shouldn't be a huge drop off or anything like that. So um, I agree. The, the big question there is who gets the green dot? if you have rotations at all three linebacker spots. Do you give it to um, Ricardo Allen? Do you give it to a guy who you're expecting to play pretty much every snap on the defensive line? Do you give it to Keanu Neal even though he's a rookie? That's the real question. Who gets the green dot? Who's going to be the guy who runs that defense, claims it as their own. Because I believe in Seattle it's Earl Thomas who has it on his helmet. And I could be wrong, but I believe it's him. Um, or it was him up until they got Bobby Wagner. And up until Wagner was 100% playing every snap. Yeah, I don't know. I assume it's Wagner. But I don't know. Um... Yeah, I mean, we look at it, and it doesn't seem like – it seems like there's a bunch of veterans that the Falcons are bringing to training camp that I would sit here and I would say, there's a pretty good chance that player doesn't make the team. Tyson Jackson would be on that list. And, you know, at least after the draft, I looked at it with between Sean Weatherspoon and Philip Wheeler, it was difficult me for me to imagine both of those guys making the roster. And at that time, I thought, oh, well, Weatherspoon's going to be the starting weak side linebacker, so Wheeler's the guy in the bubble. But now that you hear that Wheeler's getting a lot of those strong side reps, then Weatherspoon's the guy in the bubble. So 
you know, I, I think this is also going to be potentially, or if not likely to be the last summer that we see Tyler Starr and Malachi Goodman on the Falcons as well. Um, you know, both of those guys are really on the roster bubble. Not to sit here and say that they have no chance of making the team, but they, they're they definitely going to be in a, a situation where they're going to have to fight for their roster spots. They're not going to be guaranteed. They're not going to be given the benefit of the doubt, which they kind of have been these last couple of summers. Not to say that they play poorly or anything like that, but they were sort of fringe guys going into the final cuts. So let's look at it this way. You've got 25 players that you're probably going to keep on defense. Yeah. Assuming that you keep five corners, which the Falcons did last year, and four safeties, which they did for most of last year up until a certain point when they got rid of one of them, or they, uh, they added a, a fifth safety. But for the most part, it's going to be, we'll just assume it's 16 players for your front seven. I think it's safe to say, like, Brooks Reed, Vic Beasley, Courtney Upshaw, those three guys are guaranteed on it, no matter what. I think you probably are going to have Adrian Claiborne, Derek Shelby, Goodman, Jarrett. Those four guys are on it, no matter what. Uh, I think Warlow, Deion Jones, um, Devondre Campbell, those three guys are definitely on it. So that leaves you with six guys that you have to fill and you're basically missing out, like, all right, so, hold on. So Reed, Beasley, Upshaw, those three. Um, let's see. Claiborne. What was it? It was Claiborne, Babineau, Shelby, Hageman, and Jarrett. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm just trying to focus this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Reed, I got you. Jared. So you got like those eight guys already. And then um, you've got Warlow, Dion Jones, and Devondre Campbell. So that means. You're basically looking at six spots. You probably got what two linebackers, um, two edge, and two interior defensive line spots that are really up for grabs. So at at your edge, those two spots, you got Nordley Happy, who's awful, probably isn't gonna make the roster, Tyler Starr, Ivan McClendon, and Brandon Williams. I think of those guys, you're probably going to keep Star and McClendon. On the interior defensive linemen, so you got three plus five plus three, 11. Okay, yeah, so you got five guys that you're keeping. So assume that you keep one edge, and I think that's going to be Tyler Star out of that group, unless Ivan McClendon just has a great year. On the interior defensive line, I think you keep two guys. I think Embu. I don't think he's guaranteed a spot, but I think he's pretty much like the guy that they want to keep. And then it's between Malachi Goodman and Tyson Jackson. And I think the Falcons could look at the money there and say Tyson Jackson's just not worth that kind of money and get more experience for Goodman or somebody else on the roster that way. So I think you got Embu and Goodman there. And then at linebacker, you got Weatherspoon, Wheeler, Reynolds, and Green. I don't think Green's going to factor in. I don't think Reynolds is really going to factor in unless you, like, give him the special teams pass. But at the same time, I think they want to see what Deion Jones and Devondre Campbell can do on special teams. And worst case, late in the year, they'll put Weatherspoon and Wheeler out there. You know, if they have to on special teams. So, I don't know. I don't see... I could see a, a situation where Weatherspoon and Wheeler both make the roster, where Tyson Jackson gets cut with uh, Corey Johnson and Chris Mays, who are both undrafted free agents who just are, you know, and where Tyler Starr gets kept and Aaron's sitting there scratching his head like, what did Tyler Starr do to get kept? Well, look, I, I like Tyler Starr. I think he's a good player. I just think he's in a situation that's not really conducive to him sticking because basically the Falcons have gone out of the way to 
sign a bunch of players that basically do what he does but better, which is Brooks Reed and Beasley and, and now Upshaw. So he's really going to have to, you know, rise above and, and sort of showcase exactly why he's going to make the team. Now, and as you do the math, Scott, you know, I generally agree there's probably about 16 guys in the front seven that we'll end up keeping. I think when you look at the linebackers, it does look like there's a much higher probability that guys like Weatherspoon and Wheeler uh, stick. But I think it probably requires both of those guys to be starters. I just don't, you know, I know Weatherspoon played some special teams with Arizona last year, and I know Wheeler can play some special teams. But it, it to me, it's one of those situations where I don't think they're going to pay those guys what they're paying them just to basically play special teams. Um so it is one of those situations where I feel like if they're if they're backups, then they're going to be overpaid backups. So you're you worried, so you worried about their contracts? Yeah, no, it's it's one of those things where it's like Weatherspoon's making like one and a half million or something like that, and, and, and Philip Wheeler is making better in minimum. Yeah, but I'm saying you can save. You know, Reynolds is a pretty good special team, that's why he's been in the league for the last four years. Basically, play special teams. And so, well, if you can say when you factor in contracts, there's no way Philip Wheeler gets cut in any situation. Then. I wouldn't say only, that. He's only counting 680k towards the cap, unless he totally shits the bed and Tory Green looks way better than him, or like, yeah, I just I don't see a way Philip Wheeler gets cut if you're factoring contracts or you're factoring them in, because 680k towards the cap is a drop in the bucket. Fair enough. I would say Wheeler probably, especially if he's going to be starting strong side linebacker, if he, that's where he's going to spend most of his summer playing, I would say there's a less likely probability that he gets cut. But it is one of those things where if if he's going to be the fifth linebacker on the depth chart, and basically the only reason he's going to be active on Sunday is to play special teams, I don't look at Philip Wheeler and be like, oh, yeah, he's a great special teams player. I don't even know if he's played special teams in the last five years. Um so it is one of those things where if that comes down to who's the best special teams player, then he's going to be a little bit vulnerable. Um, but for me, the, the way I look at the breakdown, like I do agree with you. I think Joey and Boo is probably, should probably make the roster because I think unlike guys like Jackson and Goodman, he does something different that you don't already have. Like Goodman is basically – you know, you're hoping Goodman is basically what Derek Shelby is going to be this year or what Adrian Claybone was last year, which is an inside-outside player. Goodman's a good player, but he hasn't really shown that he's particularly skilled at anything enough, particularly in this scheme, to really merit him being kept long-term. Um, obviously, Hagerman, I think, potentially should be able to do exactly what Jackson can do. Um, so for me, I, I do feel like there is room for some of these other young guys that we're not really talking about maybe sneaking on the roster. A guy like Cappy, a guy like Ivan McClendon, a guy like Brandon Williams, I think have a, a decent shot that they could sort of sneak on if they can show some pass rush ability um, this summer. And I think all, all three guys do have some pass rush potential. Um, I, think, I think the one guy that might shock people is Chris Mays. Um, he just – he did really – really, really well at Georgia. He's got a good first step for a guy as big as he is. Um, he's 340 pounds. He gives you that something different right in the middle. And I'm not saying he's like Paul Soliai. By any means, he's not Paul Soliai. But he could give you that big, fat, run-stuffing body in the middle that Soliai was, that guy that will eat your double teams and pull guys off. And he might be better at it than what Joey Embu was. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I wasn't the world's biggest fan of Embu at um, Houston. I thought he was okay. Um, I don't look at either Corey Johnson or Chris Mays as better prospects than Embu was. And, you know, having a year in the scheme, I think, gives Embu uh, a significant leg up. But it wouldn't shock me just because the Falcons, you know, I don't – one of my issues is I don't necessarily see Grady Jarrett as the greatest fit at that base nose tackle. Like, I think he can eventually be, you know, a Brandon Meebane type of player, but I don't think he's quite there yet. 
And I personally would have rather seen his primary role this year be playing beside Babineau in the um, nickel sub package. And I feel like his playing that nose tackle isn't going to be the best use of him. So having somebody else in the roster that can play that role, like a Joey Mbu, makes a lot of sense. So that's where I sort of see Mbu sticking on this team just to have a backup there. Because we didn't really have a backup behind Soli last year um, playing that role on the roster, at least. So. Okay. All right, Scott, you got anything else to add um, about the front seven discussion before we move on to the mailbag? Uh, no. Okay. All right, our first mailbag question comes from Jelani234. Predict your base and nickel defensive starters. Well, I think the secondary is pretty much set. Um, so for both base and nickel, left corner is going to be Desmond Trufant. Right corner is going to be Robert Alford in the base. I'm going to assume it's going to be a King King for the first four games in the nickel and then Jalen Collins when he comes back. Um, in the slot, you're going to have Robert Alford. Ricardo Allen is free safety, Keanu Neal is strong safety. I don't see anything changing there. Um, at Leo in the base, I think it's going to be Courtney Upshaw who ends up winning that job. I think Tyson Jackson and Rasheed Hageman are going to be the three in the five tech. Who plays which, it all just depends on who wins what in camp. At nose tackle, I think Joey Embu plays that spot. Um, unless Chris Mays comes out of nowhere and takes the job. At uh, weak side linebacker, I think Devondre Campbell wins the job both in the base and in nickel. At strong side linebacker in the base, I think eventually it's going to be Vic Beasley, but we're going to see a heavy rotation of both Philip Wheeler and Brooks Reed there. I think at middle linebacker, you're going to see Paul Warlow in the base and then Deion Jones in the nickel, uh, just because Jones is a way better uh, coverage guy than Warlow is, and Warlow is a way better run stuffer than Jones is. Um, and then in the nickel on passing downs, I think it's Vic Beasley, Grady Jarrett, Derek Shelby, and Adrian Claiborne. And I know Aaron may not love to hear this, but maybe Jonathan Babineau's up for, uh, for being cut. Well, I'll quit the show if that happens. Um, you know. Nah, in, in, in a realistic sense, I kind of hope Hageman balls out at 5-tech in the base and that they cut Tyson Jackson because he sucks at three tech, and they put Babineau at three tech. So the base is more Upshaw, Babineau, and Boo Hageman, because Babineau is actually a decent run defender too. And then it gives you at least some sort of pass rush on the interior. Yeah, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disapprove of that. You know, I think the key with Babineau, regardless, you know, the, the thing about Babineau is he can do really whatever you want him to do. It's just the key is you just got to – keep his snap count limited at this point because he's, you know, he played a lot of snaps over those last couple of years with Mike, Mike Smith and Mike Nolan. And um, he just, he shouldn't be really playing more than like 400, 500 snaps going into this year. So however you want to use it, if it's in the base, then fine. If it's in the nickel, then fine. Um, just make sure he's a three tech. Yeah. Um, for me, the starters, like, Secondary wise, you know, we you know who the regular secondary is, true fine and offer at corner, Keanu Neal, Ricardo Allen at safety. Um, I don't think the nickel cornerback, at least for the first four weeks, is on the roster. I don't think the Kim King is that guy. Um, I would be very surprised. I think it's probably gonna be like Philip Adams or somebody that gets cut at the end of the training camp off the waiver wire. Um, and then I, I assume eventually it'll be Jalen Collins as the nickel cornerback. Um, with Alfred moving into the slot and whoever the nickel guy is playing right corner. Um, starting the season at linebacker in the base, I think it's probably going to be Wheeler, Warlow, and, and Weatherspoon. But as I said earlier, I feel like there's a, you know, probably like an 80 to 90% chance that by year's end, that's probably Beasley, Jones, and, and Campbell. Um, 
I do think whoever's the middle linebacker and weak side linebacker in the base is going to be their sort of go-to option in the nickel um, with a decent possibility that they try to use Deion Jones in the same way they use Malcolm Smith um, back in 2013, which is basically as a nickel um, coverage specialist. But um, in the front for the base run defense, you know, I think right now it looks like it's going to be Hageman at strong side defensive end. Jared at nose tackle, I guess Tyson Jackson at three tech and, and Brooks Reed at the at the Leo spot. Um, but I'm very iffy on that one because I just don't imagine um, Tyson Jackson. I just it doesn't make sense from from my, at least my perspective where he would be on the team. But uh, in the nickel, I think as I said, Beasley at the left defensive end spot, Babineau beside him. Shelby probably at right defensive tackle and Claiborne beside him at right defensive end. And that's probably what you're looking at to start the season. And, you know, we'll see it, how it plays out um, to see if by year's end. But I do feel like with the defense particularly, I think Dan Quinn is still shaping up this defense. And what we see in week one isn't necessarily what we'll see in week 17. And the hope is, at least for me, by year's end, he will have at least – firmly be able to say, okay, this is what this guy is going to be in our scheme. And then when they approach next off season, whether that's looking at another pass rusher, another interior defensive lineman, another linebacker, safeties and whatnot, that they're going to be looking and saying, okay, we know exactly where, you know, eight out of our 11 pieces are for our, our starting defense. So we just need to find those last three pieces. I don't necessarily know if they know that, Right now, I don't necessarily know if they're going to know that by the end of training camp, but I do feel confident that at least by the end of the season, they should be able to be able to set that in cement, I guess. I agree. All right. We got another question from Jelani234. He says, what are your expectations on the D-line? I mean, that's kind of a loaded question. What exactly are you asking? Do you want us to talk about the sack totals? I, mean, I think we just both talked about who we think is starting and kind of the rotation, but I mean, I I'm expecting I, better I would, sack totals than 19. I would have answered the question based off of what my expectations for, you know, sack totals and how good you think the defensive line is. I think against the run, they'll be just as good as they were last year. Maybe even better because – Going against the runs, a, a full front seven, like make sure everybody's on the same page. And I think they did a good job of getting everybody on the same page the last year, keeping the uh, yards per carry from opposing teams under four. Like they did a really good job stopping the run last year. I think this year with the pass rush, probably 33, 34 sacks. I'm going to be optimistic here. I think Dick Beasley gets it going, hits 10 sacks. Um, I think Shelby surprises a lot of us, gets probably six. And I think the rest of it's a bunch of two and one sack guys. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, if, if I'm putting a sack total on where I think Beasley's going to be, I think he'll probably double his sack total from last year and probably get like eight, eight and a half, something like that. Um, I'm hoping for more, but. Um, you know, if he gets to eight, then I'll be happier or seven and a half, I guess. Um, for the team wise, I'm sort of seeing maybe a jump to like 30. You know, I'm not as optimistic that we're going to see a huge leap forward for the pass rush. I think we're still, we're going to see improvement certainly, but I do feel like there's going to be several games, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that game against Green Bay in the middle of the year where, we're just sitting there watching Aaron Rodgers just carve up our defense because we're not getting any pressure on the quarterback or we're not getting reliable pressure on the quarterback. So I think that's going to be concern moving forward. And I do feel like there's a reasonably high possibility that our defensive line issues going into the off season out coming out of the season, we're still going to be looking at, you know, first and second round picks as, you know, addressing that edge rusher spot, trying to get somebody across from Vic Beasley that can really put pressure on the quarterback. Um, you know, the run defense, I'm a little concerned with the run defense because the interesting thing about the Falcons, if you go back and watch last season, which was like the first 10 or so games, they were like top two or three 
in run defense in the league. And then like the last five or six games, they were like bottom three in, in the run defense. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do more with poor tackling, but it does concern me a little bit with that sort of coincided with the, the point of the year where Paul Solat was dealing with injuries. And I am a little bit concerned that Grady Jarrett's, his game is more of a penetrating style as opposed to holding blocks, which you, you kind of want a nose tackle that can do a little bit of both, um, two gapping and being penetrator. And that's why Brandon Meebane was so good in his scheme in his prime. Um, I don't know if Jarrett's going to be that guy quite yet. And so I am a little concerned, particularly with him playing that spot with Jackson being whatever he is. And with us having faster, but still undersized linebackers, I do wonder a little bit if our run defense is going to be as good as we hope it can be. Um, I think that's a big reason why the Falcons drafted Keanu Neal, because they're like, we're going to need this guy to be a real enforcer against the run um, because of what we have up front. So that is a little bit of a question. It might wind up being very good this year, and I'll be eating crow, but I do have a little bit of concerns that our, our run defense might take as big a step backwards as our pass rush will take forward. So, I think it's more who they played. I think it's those two games against the uh, the Panthers that really kind of screwed everything because in those last four games, the only real – or in like – during the season, the only real tough games that they had in their run defense was against the Panthers. You know, I, I don't think the Tampa Bay really dominated. Oh, and then the Vikings. But everybody has a rough day against Adrian Peterson when they hand him the ball 25 times. I feel like there was another game where. Uh, the, that game in the Buccaneers. So. Yeah, towards the end of the season, they did have some trouble in the game. In the in their own game, they did have some issues, but I don't know. I guess I just I'm an eternal optimist. I think that the defense is going to be fine. Uh, you know, I think the defense. We won't be talking about the defense as a weakness um, coming out of the season, but I do feel like, you know. I'm, you know, I'm the negative guy, but I feel like the defense probably isn't as good as people think it is just because I think relative to the offensive struggles, people sort of gave the defense a pass last year. Now, the one thing I did like about seeing the defense was given how many turnovers we had on offense, the Falcons weren't just giving away seven points every time they turned the ball over. And so that's really the, the positive outlook I could say about this defense is when we were giving away the ball in our own territory, oftentimes the other team basically had to settle for three points and, and occasionally was punting the ball. So that I think is really the sort of foundation. I want to see that more, that type of defense that can be put the clamps on teams more this year. But I, I am a little bit concerned because I think playing much better quarterbacks this year than we did last year. I, it was interesting to me that the first game we played last year where we faced a legitimately good quarterback to carve up our defense, which was that week six game against the Saints, they did. And I feel like we're not going to be able to feast on the Zach Mettenbergers and the Blaine Gabbert, even though we didn't really feast on him um, this year like we did last year. So that is a little slight concern for me. If they don't show enough growth, we could see this team having a little bit more issues on defense this year. I, I think, though, you're still going to see an average defense. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think overall they'll probably be average, but I do think there'll be a little bit more downs um, this year just because of the level of competition is better. Oh, no doubt. I mean, you are facing one of the best young quarterbacks in Derek Carr, another very good young quarterback in Jameis Winston. Um, I don't think Denver is going to really be the issue that people are making them out to be. They're missing Trevathan. They're missing um, yeah. Malik Jackson. They don't have either of their starting quarterbacks from last year, and they're starting Mark Sanchez. So I'm not too worried about Denver. Seattle's probably going to destroy the Falcons. Um, it's not going to be a fun game to watch. I'm not too worried about San Diego. 
I like Philip Rivers, but I don't know if they've got a, a great support structure around him. The the game that really scares me is Green Bay. Out of all of them. If the Falcons can find the pass rush in those first seven games, I think they might have a chance against Green Bay. Yeah, I would agree. But when you look at the schedule, that first six, seven games, or actually that first five games is pretty pretty much hell. Tampa Bay is going to be a lot better this year. Oakland is a damn good team, and people are underselling them. At New Orleans on a on a what's it called? Steve Gleason night is never a fun day. Yeah, Atlanta. been there before. Yep. Past what three years they make it a Steve Gleason night? I think they do it for luck. But uh, and then Carolina is never a fun game over the past four years. Denver, you know, they won the Super Bowl last year. And it's in their house. But I just I feel like that's the game that if the Falcons go two and two to start the season, I think that's the game that they can go, you know what? We're for real. We beat the defending champs. Yeah, we lost to Oakland and Carolina, but we beat the defending champs on this game. And they can take that game and build confidence for the rest of the season. Okay. Yeah, I I think Denver's offense is not going to be a problem for us, but I, their defense still scares me, even though they lost some key points. I think their defense is perfectly constructed to, to stop our, our offense. Um, you know, I think obviously we know in the past that if, if we can't get pressure on Drew Brees, he's going to carve, he's going to put, uh, you know, 300 plus yards on our defense. That, did, that didn't change last year. I don't expect it to change this year. So we really need our pass rush to step up. Seattle is another team. Terrible offensive line, but Russell Wilson's so good at sort of, you know, extending plays and, and chucking it up deep to Doug Baldwin and the like that that can create some issues for our defense. Um, I wouldn't sleep on San Diego. I feel like their offense could really give our defense fits because Antonio Gates and Danny Woodhead are, are the exact type of players that really gave us fits last year in terms of matchups. Keenan Allen is, is no joke, and Travis Benjamin has – deep speed and, and Philip Rivers loves to chuck it deep. So I feel like people are sleeping on San Diego. They might not be good, um, but they could be a, a sort of surprise team. Obviously Green Bay, Tampa Bay should be improved. Philadelphia, I'm not too worried about their defense is the only thing that's their front seven is really the only thing that's scary about them. Obviously Arizona's good. And in Kansas City is a solid overall team, especially if Jamal Torres is healthy. And you know, LA I don't expect Jared Goff to be great this year, but if Gurley can, if they can get Gurley going, then that could be a problem. And so those are the types of games I'm worried about our run defense. You know, LA is going to want to run the football, pound the ball down our throats, and we have to stop it. So it's not going to be a secret how to beat the Rams, stop the run, and and block Aaron Donald. If you can do those things, you can beat the Rams. But I do have my concerns that the Falcons can do those things. So we'll see how it plays out. All right, our last question comes from Luez Abraham. Who will have the better season, the Hawks without Al Horford? or the, and then, Oh, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> the Falcons without White in the new Sanu. Is, is that supposed to be Dwight Howard? Yeah, I think so, a new Dwight oh. Howard. Uh, he said DW, and I was like, that confused me. Yeah, I think it's um... – I think the Hawks. I'd say the Falcons probably go nine and seven or ten and six, and I'm the optimistic one, which means Aaron's going to go. They're seven and nine, eight and eight at best. And I think the Hawks go back to the playoffs as a four or even five seed, and that's going to be better than what the Falcons do. Like basically, no matter what happens, Hawks are still going to lose in like the first or second round, but. Again, it's what we're expecting them to do. Um, you know, I want to say push. Uh, you know, the Hawks won like what, like forty-eight games last year, which is like the equivalent of winning nine games in a sixteen-game schedule. I think. So it's like if you think the Hawks will be the same, then basically, if the Falcons don't get the nine and seven or better, then the Hawks technically win that. Um. I sort of feel like the Falcons are probably going to win like seven or eight games, 
which basically means, you know, if the Hawks can get to like 42 wins or something, then they'll probably have the better season. I think they should be able to do that. Um, so I'll probably say the Hawks, if we're, if we're basing it off a win total, um, you know, if we're basing it off of hoping, you know, the Hawks play in the Eastern Conference, they're not beating the Cavs or anything. So, you know, they might make the playoffs, but they ain't doing nothing in it. Um, Falcons got a decent chance that if, at least if they get into the postseason, if Julio's healthy, then they they could do some damage in the postseason. But but I'll, I'll probably you know based off of win totals, I'll go with the Hawks. All right, it's, guys. it's we hold on, hold on. Aaron just said if the Falcons get to the playoffs, they can do something. Hold on now. Where is this? This is like actual belief from Aaron. Well, look, I believe in the offense. Is it the defense being, you know, average that's giving you this hope? My, my thing with the Falcons going into the season, I think three things have to happen for them to make the playoffs. I think Julio has to be healthy. I think the running game has to be significantly improved. I think last year they were sort of middle of the pack. I think people kind of overrate how good the running game was based off of those six big games that Devontae Freeman had, but the other 10 games out of the year, they really didn't do anything right in the football. So I think they need to go from like being like the 16th best run team, which they were for most of last year, to like the eighth best run team. And I think their pass rush needs to take a significant leap forward. And, you know, my sort of conservative prediction of 30 sacks, that needs to be more like 36 to 40 sacks. If those three things happen, I'm very confident the Falcons will be in the postseason. I think if two out of those three things happen, then I think there's a pretty good chance the Falcons will be in the postseason. If only one out of those three things happen, I don't think that's going to really work for them. So based off of the caveat that all three of those things happen and the Falcons do make the postseason, then I think they can do some damage. I mean, the only reason that the Falcons have won a playoff game in the last, you know, 10 years is because of Julio Jones. Um, and it is one of those situations where if he it goes off like he did in 2012 or like Larry Fitzgerald did in 2008 and has one of those spectacular postseason runs, which we all know Julio is capable of because we saw it you know, four years ago, um, they could be a dangerous team. I'm not going to sit here and say they're going to go to the Super Bowl or anything like that, but they could be one of those teams that you're like, oh, we don't want to play that team, you know, like the Ravens have been for you know, most of the last decade when it gets to the postseason or the Giants when when the rare times that they get to the postseason. So what you're saying is if they could get to the postseason, they might be capable of doing what they did to start last season. Yeah. So they off like four just good games. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think there's sort of, you know, I think their best case scenario is, is maybe a, a close second round loss to the Panthers or the, Cardinals or the Seahawks. I think that's sort of their ceiling. But, you know, if Julio puts up, you know, 250 hearts in a game, then they got a higher ceiling than that. But, um, you know, if we play the Cardinals, we know that he can put up big numbers against them. We know that he, you know, he can put big numbers up against the Panthers, as we saw last year, at the end of last year. So they got a shot. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they'll definitely get there, but, you know, my pessimism isn't because I, I think there's no sh chance that the team is good. I just think too many things have to go right, which as a longtime Falcon fan, I know usually best case scenario is like half of the things that need to go right, go right. And so I'm just, there'll probably be eight and eight, seven and nine sort of team. So. I'm hoping for that 2012 kind of lucky season where they just play a lot of close games against tough teams and, you know, they're magically like 11 and 5 or 12 and 4. And we're going, man, where did this team come from? That is a possibility. I, I won't say it won't. It's not. So it, it could happen and I could be, you know, everybody's like, Aaron, you're the negative guy. And now here's that plate of crow you got to eat. So that could happen. Well, I mean, there's a lot of games on the schedule that are just toss-ups right now, too which last year I wouldn't have even considered them a toss up. Um, like Green Bay. I think Green Bay got worse. I think the Falcons got better. Um, 
I'd say Kansas City is a toss-up because of that Justin Houston injury. Even if he does come back this year, he's not going to be 100%. And that's a big part of their pass rush. And Tom Bahali, even though he's you know, a good pass rusher, he could fall off the table this year because of how old he is. At least in some aspect. You know, Los Angeles, they have a rookie quarterback. San Francisco doesn't have a quarterback. You know, there's a lot of games that are toss-ups this year. And as long as the offense – I feel like as long as the offensive line stays healthy, this team will be a good team. And I feel like I've said that the last two years, in 14 and in 15. And we've seen the center go down in 14 and in 15. Okay. Okay. We'll see what happens. Yep. All right, guys. Next week we will be back to uh, talk about the secondary and special teams and our weekly uh, positional previews, and that will be uh, will be right on the eve of training camp. Hopefully, you know, if the Falcons got two open roster spots, they will have filled them. So maybe we'll talk about that next week or something like that. But if you guys want to get your questions in, you can use the hashtag Falcons Mailbag. You can tweet at me. I'm at Falcons. Scott is at Karasic S. You can tweet at the show at Falcons PFC. Check us out on ProFootballCentral.com. You can go back and, and see all of our archives. Please rate and review us and subscribe to us on iTunes. Um, you know, if you rate and review us, you give us five stars, four stars, whatever. That helps us get more eyeballs or earballs or whatever you want to call them. So please do that. Um, and you know, I'm finally back to writing again, so you can check out more content at foulfans.com, previewing um, the different position battles in training camp all this week. Scott, do you have any content coming up? I know you've been writing some like MMA stuff, right? I've been doing some MMA stuff. I've been doing some league-wide stuff. I did a couple articles this past week um, on just things that are going on, like Kirk Cousins being an idiot and turning down a ton of money from the Redskins or Eric Berry not getting a long-term deal, which was kind of messed up. So, I mean, I've, I've been putting in, putting stuff out there and, you know, I've got an MMA thing today that I've posted up, but there's a lot of stuff that I've been involved in posting for the next couple of weeks. Well, there you go, folks. Um, we'll be back next week and, uh, Looking forward to actually getting to talk about the talking football work this close.